After my grandfather died, we come across his memoirs, and it was where my granddad was been writing his story down um, as regards to his uh, prisoner war days in, in Burma. As we were reading it, we couldn't believe the torture he went through on the Burma Railway and how he come out and survived what he went through. And then the direct ship from the, from the Americans that torpedoed the ship, how on earth he'd come out of that and survived that, only to go on to Nagasaki to witness the A-bomb. A talented English footballer in the 1930s, Johnny Sherwood saw his career blighted by the Second World War, an experience his family knew little of until they began reading his memoir. I had never worn anything of my own. Everything was hand-me-down. It was it not, was not until I was spotted ball kicking a ball around the park and signed up to Reading Football Club that my parents, that my parents took me to a shoe, shoe shop to buy me my first pair of proper new football boots. You, you should have, have seen, seen how, how proud, proud I was. He was a high-scoring player. And lots of the headlines in the paper cuttings and everything from the past and programmes and that always played him up. He was very good prospect for to play for the country, for England. The Islington Corinthians played 96 games. He played in 76 of those games and scored 76 goals. And there were eight or nine top London clubs and clubs from around the globe wanting to sign him. Uh, so he, he chose Reading because his father was a keen Reading supporter and he was a Reading man. Unfortunately, war broke out and he had to go to war. So his football career was put on hold for a few years. We thought we were going to Basra in Iraq, but on the way the Japs bombed our harbour and everything changed. We were rerouted to Singapore and we were here for the last days of this terrifying Japanese bombardment. Now 96, Robert Hucklesby was rerouted to Burma with Johnny. As a fighting force, we were no longer going to continue. He was captured um, and put in a prisoner of war camp. So, uh, thinking, well, we're no longer in the army in any other form, we're now prisoners of war. And it was difficult to know what to expect. The guards at that particular time were brutal, um, cruel, they starved the prisoners. And the tortures were horrific, really horrific. Most of them had a, a bamboo cane and they'd hit you with a bamboo cane. He very often also said that he took beatings for the weaker guys that you know who he was friendly with or whatever. They would haul one officer out at random and insult him or, or beat, beat him, him. Or we were forced to watch and do nothing to help him. A group of Japanese and Korean guards gave me a good beating up with a bamboo stick, ripping my flesh with every strike. I, I lost, lost count, count of, of how, how many, many as I struggled to stay silent. I knew any noise I made would provoke an even greater frenzy of physical abuse. I don't know how long this punishment lasted, but finally they tired themselves out and I crumbled into a bloody heap on the ground. For all their cruelty, the guards sometimes let them play football, but they didn't really have the energy levels to sort of compete, and the Japanese knew this. They were tortured, but because of Dad being a footballer, and they, he, they suggested to him that could he arrange for, get the English soldiers to play a game against the Japanese soldiers for their own pleasure. It seems strange that these devils 
who was so cruel to us in the daytimes at work, could smile and kick around with us in the evening. We were glad of the chance, but we couldn't trust them. So we tried not to be too good. Football was my life, but soon we got too weak to play. As a prisoner, he was one of the many who had to work on the railway, the Burma Railway, and lots of men, even though they were too weak to work, they would get beaten and forced to work on the railway. We had to begin the terrible task of building the railway itself, the railway that would become the notorious railway of death. I was either cutting the railway track, carrying earth in heavy baskets, or breaking up stones. Whatever my task, I was not allowed to return to camp until I had completed my quota. All the time the guards jabbed at us, shouting, Speedo! Speedo! It was partly because you weren't working hard enough, for, for what they said, or it could be that you didn't interpret what they were saying correctly. And if they happened to fall down, they would be sort of poked about to get up. If they weren't strong enough, they would just literally die. They say that for every sleeper that was laid, there was a death. When we got back from a day's work, the weaker men usually collapsed on their lice-infested sleeping platforms. It was now going to be the survival of the fittest. You know, he was made to dig his own cemetery. You realise that uh, life was very cheap, that we were slaves. He always said that if he hadn't been as fit as he'd been, he would never have survived. When one part of the railway was finished, they would just get shipped off and moved around to the next camp. Um, to do, for, do the same work further up the track. And that's how it repeated until it was completed. We were herded onto this forbidden grey ship, the Kachadoki Maru. We were forced down into the dark and dirty holds, shoulder to shoulder. The feeling of claustrophobia and impending doom hung heavy. Our convoy ran into an American submarine nest and we were attacked from both sides. The deafening sound and smell of tremendous explosions filled the air as the ship took two direct hits at once. I could only save myself. I was counting down to jump. Please God, let me make it. I watched the ship slide gracefully out of sight down to her peaceful resting place on the seabed, taking with her hundreds of young British men who had no chance at all of survival in the holds which became their tomb. I floated and swam, floated and swam for what seemed like hours in the darkness. Suddenly, out of the distance, loomed a large warship. It was like I imagined a mirage to be and for two or three seconds, I couldn't believe it. None of us could, but then we let rip. We screamed and shouted with delight. And they were all cheering the survivors, not knowing that it was a Japanese ship, and, but it was, and um, obviously taken on board and then taken to another camp, which was in Nagasaki and um, continued work, working. The Americans were, were bombing everything around Japan at the time, and that's when they witnessed the A-bomb hit Nagasaki. I cannot remember what the time was, but I do very clearly remember the great rumble we heard. It was so loud that I ducked my head down for a few seconds. When I opened my eyes and looked across towards the city of Nagasaki, just visible in the distance, 
I saw a fast-growing black cloud that spiralled upwards. The following morning, nobody was guarding us at all. I was completely baffled and felt the first stirrings of excitement. When I heard this plane and then saw it come over and I saw the side doors open and a RAF, I knew, RAF man, I realised that the war was over. We could see the airmen waving to us. We shot to our feet in delight, everyone jumping for pure joy. It was quite a sight to see all of us, feeble skeletons, suddenly energised and full of vigour. That wave I shall never forget. I thought, we've made it. The wicked war was over at last. They were all there to meet me. I can't tell you how wonderful it was to be back in the heart of my family again. After all those years apart, let's go for a drink, said one of my brothers. Upon returning to England, Johnny resumed his football career, but he rarely completed 90 minutes. War had left its mark on him. To get through that and to survive that, but it did leave scars, deep, deep ones, which he didn't always talk about, hardly ever. The war affected him terribly, and um, him writing everything down, his feelings and emotions, and the story of what he went through from beginning to end, um, I feel was a massive let out for him. Remembrance is very important to me because many of my friends didn't make it home. There are thousands left behind in war graves in Thailand, in Singapore, and in Burma. I remember him with great fondness and love. I mean, he was my best friend ever. And um, he, was, he was a very big family man. He, he thought a lot of his mother and his brothers and sisters and um, yeah, he loved all his grandchildren. He loved all of them. And um, he was a good dad, good granddad. I sometimes ask my comrades when I meet up with them if you were there again and you had to choose between what we went through or death, what would you choose? Death, definitely, they'd say. I can understand why, but I don't think I would answer that myself, even now. I thank God that we survivors are here at all. The fact we are shows that miracles can happen. The scars are in my soul and will never go, but I think I am dealing with them better now. Despite my enduring problems, I can't grumble. I'm alive. 